We're turning to Joshua 24 this morning. We've almost finished our studies in Joshua. Just two or three brief thoughts this morning. We're not going to finish Joshua 24 today. We're just going to take the first section down as far as the end of verse 13. So let's read together. Joshua 24, verse 1. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau. I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it, but Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt and you came unto the sea and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. When they cried unto the Lord he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them and your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt and ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. They brought you into the land of the Amorites which dwelt on the other side of Jordan and they fought with you and I gave them into your hand and you might, that you might destroy, sorry, that you might possess their land and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called Balaam the son of Beor to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. And he went over Jordan, and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I've given you a land for which ye did not labour, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them, of the vineyards, olive yards, olive yards which ye planted, not do ye eat. We'll just stop there for today. Um, if you've got your map book, page 19. We read in the earlier part of this uh, reading about Abraham being taken from the other side of the flood. And Abraham, of course, and his father and his brother, um, certainly Lot was his nephew, wasn't he? Travelled from Ur of the Chaldees, if you've got page 19, look at the Persian Gulf down in the right hand corner. And just slightly above that you've got Ur, which is where Abraham began. And that green line takes you up to Haran, or Haran, uh, which is where his father died. And then the red line brings, brings Abraham and his family on down, in, with a lot down, uh, into the land of Canaan, finishing at Shechem, which of course is where these things are being said. Uh, as we read in verse 1. Um, so the other side of the flood, uh, looking at my map book, probably doesn't refer to the Euphrates, if the, if the cartographer's got it right. The flood doesn't refer to the Euphrates, but certainly close to the Euphrates. And between, of course, Babylonia, where Ur is, and the Mediterranean Sea and Canaan, you've got the Arabian Desert. Well, they didn't use the cross the Arabian Desert, so... When you read, say, in the book of Daniel, or rather books of Jeremiah, and Ezekiel maybe, um, of the armies coming from the north, uh, referring to the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, the Babylonians are in the east, so why did they come from the north? Quite simply because they couldn't cross the Arabian deserts. They would go up, as you see Abraham did, in what's called the Fertile Crescent. So the Arabian desert obviously is not fertile, so that's why you read sometimes of the armies coming from the north, the Assyrians as well, uh, would, would come from the north. It's, it's said the north rather than the east, simply because they would come around 
the fertile crescent but I just thought you might like that little bit of background of what it means to be coming from the other side of the flood the flood in all likelihood I would suggest refers to the river Jordan of course um, which is parallel with the red line you see running down from Haran to Shechem so that might put an end to the use of our map book this morning you put that to one side if you like I just thought you might like that little bit of background Look at verse 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So it's the Lord speaking. Most of what we read, uh, in fact, all of what we've read in verse 13, is the Lord speaking through Joshua. Uh, so in that sense, it's a prophecy. It's not prophesying. When we, when we talk of prophesying, usually we mean future events. But if a man speaks by the Spirit, he's a prophet. And so Joshua is prophesying here. The Lord is speaking through, just, through Joshua. Now I would say first of all that accurate history proves the integrity of the Bible. And uh, let me just give you an example. Matthew chapter 1. Just one example. There's hundreds and hundreds of them, but just one to, to underscore what I'm saying accurate history proves the integrity of the Bible chapter 1 of Matthew I'm just going to read the first six verses that will suffice for, the, for our purpose the book of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren and Judas begat Pharaohs and Zerah of Tamar and Pharaohs begat Ezram and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasan, and Naasan begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. I just read those verses, those first few verses to you, because this is Old Testament history. And if you read through your Old Testament and you start with Abraham, these are the names that come and they come in that sequence. And if you were to read on through here, you've got all the kings of Judah that follow and they all come in exactly the sequence of which you'd read of them in the books of Kings and Chronicles. And you can't make that up. You just cannot make that up. Now, I don't know whether it's true. It probably is that Matthew is said to have taken uh, these genealogies from the records that they had at the time, the Chronicles, maybe in Jerusalem. Um... But that doesn't make it any less inspired. I'm sure that uh, if there was a mistake in those chronicles, the Holy Spirit would have led Matthew to get it right. Uh, but he may have used those, he may not. But what I'm trying to say to you is that as you follow these names down here, you have all the kings listed from the time of, of uh, David and Solomon and so on. And no matter where you look here, you know, if you look at little details like Boaz and Rechab and, and so forth, you find this all just matches exactly with what you read in your Old Testament. And you could do that anywhere in the Bible. Accurate history proves the inter it's, its accurate history proves the integrity of the Bible. Honest history proves the fidelity of the Bible. Honest history proves the fidelity of the Bible. Because this is an honest history. People often say that history is written by the winners. I dare say if you wrote a book, if you read a book on the Second World War by German authors, you might get a slightly different picture than if you read a book on the Second World War by British authors. I'm sure in many places. And uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I can't think of details off the top of my head, but some of the Babylonians, for example, and, and you know, we have some of their writings in the British Museum. They're very quiet about their failures. <laughs> uh, there's, some, there's some of the writing of Sennacherib, uh, in the British Museum and he's very quiet about the fact that he couldn't take Jerusalem what he does say is I'll shut him up like a bird in a cage this is Sennacherib and you can find the, the monuments in the British Museum I shut Hezekiah up like a bird in a cage what he doesn't tell you is that he couldn't take he couldn't take Jerusalem and his army was destroyed by an angel and of course he wouldn't tell you because he was dead at the time but his sons then murdered him of course when he got home and so people say history is written by the enemy by, by the winners and I, I'm sure there's, a, there's an element of truth in that 
And I would suggest, not wishing to put off anybody that's studying history, like my dear wife, I would suggest that at least half, and I like to study history too, but I would suggest that at least half of our, and it's my suggestion, half of our history books, I guess, are inaccurate because they come from a bias. Now, I'm an Englishman, I love England. Less and less, I have to say. I think, I, I don't know whether it's a spiritual thing to love one's country. I suspect it is. You find Paul loved his country. You find Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And uh, I think perhaps it's natural and maybe even spiritual to love one's country. It's much hated now, of course, because it's not global. <laughs> it's not the global mentality. So you're not supposed to love your country anymore. If you love your country, you're a racist and all the rest of it, a jingoist and so on and so forth. But I think it's, it's natural, if not spiritual, to love one's country. And so there's this bias very often with, with uh, history writers. One of the great historians, a man called Herodotus, I think he was a Greek, he may have been a Persian, but I think he was a Greek. And you can buy his, I've got one, Gene's got one, you can buy his histories. Um, and they're held in great regard. But one of his contemporaries, whose name, I know it begins with A, but his name's still eluding me, called him a liar. <laughs> Well, how would we know? How would we know? But his histories are generally received as being pretty accurate. But what is special about the Bible is its candour. No one is glorified except the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham's not glorified. David's not glorified. Paul's not glorified. Peter's certainly not glorified. None of the great men of the Bible are glorified. There's only one man in the Bible who is glorified, always, and rightly so, and of course that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible is special because it's honest. And honest history, to my mind at least, proves the fidelity, or is a major factor in underscoring the trustworthiness, the fidelity, the faithfulness of the Bible. It speaks about men in such condemnatory language. It speaks the truth about sin that men are so much so that men are offended and won't read it. And what they've done of course now is in the modern Bibles they've, they've cut down some of the sharp edges that we find in our old book. This book's in your face. This book's got an edge. It's really got an edge that the modern ones don't have because they're trying not to offend anybody. We read those few verses didn't we from uh, Matthew 7. And do you notice what the Lord Jesus said to his disciples? Um, if ye which are evil. <laughs> what a thing to say. I mean, how many vicars would, would say that the disciples were evil? Jesus says you're evil to his disciples. Because men are by nature evil. We're the children of Adam. We've inherited his sin. And this is the Bible's verdict on mankind. The Bible says nothing about the milk of human kindness. Whether that's a fair phrase, I don't really know. I, I suppose you might say there is such a thing. But we're born in sin and conceived in iniquity, says David. And there are no exceptions. And the Bible alone is faithful in this. It is, the Bible, to an honest reader, patently and overtly honest. And uh, if you're interested in the integrity of history, one of the great men you can read is Thomas Hartwell Horn. I've got one or two of his uh, snippets from one or two of his books downstairs. And he shows and he demonstrates, just using the scriptures, the integrity of scripture. The trustworthy, I suppose I've gone back really, haven't I, to the, to the integrity of the history. And if I was a Bible college uh, a principal, I would, Thomas Hartwell Horn would be on the would be on the ticket. People would have to read Thomas Hartwell Horn. Probably most of you never heard of him, but he's a great writer on the authenticity of Scripture. So accurate history proves the integrity of the Bible. And as I say, we could look at instance upon instance of that. Hundreds of them. Honest history proves the fidelity or the faithfulness of the Bible. And repeated history underscores the necessity of the Bible. And that's what is going on in this portion that we've read here, it's repeated history God is taking them through from the time of Abraham, he's reminding them of what he did with them it's evident that God wanted Israel to remember her history <laughs> I 
our leaders don't want you to remember your history. One of the one of the first things that they started to do when they decided to corrupt the educational system in America was to rewrite history. Was to get together a new school of historians who would rewrite history. Those that don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. The one thing we never learn from history is the one thing we learn from history is that we never learn from history. And so round about 1900s, thereabouts, over in the States, the likes of the Rockefeller Foundation and others, the Carnegie Foundation, was set up to corrupt the education system, particularly in the realm of history. And that's why history is out the window now, unless it's Black History Month, or history, Women's History Month, or whatever it might be, One-Legged Polish Bus Drivers History Month. Sorry, shouldn't be flippant. But, you know, real history... We don't want to be told about it. They don't want, us to, they don't want you to know what happened in the war because they want you to get on with the Germans. Well, we should, of course. We should get on with the Germans, the same as the Japanese. That's right. Uh, but they don't want us to, to think about the victories, maybe, that the nation enjoyed. Now, we would put those victories down. I hope you would, to the Lord's goodness to us. We're not special people. We don't deserve those things. It's righteousness that exalts a nation and nothing else. It's not because the SAS are fitter and smarter and stronger and all this. It's nothing of the sort. It's because God was with us. That's why we won so many wars. And that's why we're useless now as a, as a military power. But I digress. Repeated history underscores the necessity of the Bible. And it's evident from here that God wanted Israel to remember her history. And this was done in many ways. For example, the feasts. The Passover was to be a yearly reminder of their release from bondage in Egypt. That's what that feast was all about. We used to celebrate bonfire night. John Trapp wrote in the 1600s, he was born I think 1601, died about 1668. So he was just a little lad when the gunpowder plot uh, was, was uncovered, 1605, November the 5th. And it was commemorated all over the country. Bonfires all over the country. Yes, they burnt Guy Fawkes in effigy, and there's no excuse for that. But John Trapp wrote in his commentary at that time. It's quite interesting. He was writing on the, uh, the feast uh, set up at the end of the book of uh, Esther, Purim, which was, which was not a feast that God had ordained, but a feast that they decided to keep for the deliverance of the nation. And much like Bonfire Night. And in his commentary in, uh, why do I keep forgetting the name, Esther chapter 10, uh, when he's writing about Purim, he writes about bonfire night and he says something like, this day should never be forgotten. <laughs> because one of the things that we learned at that time was the danger of Romanism. That without, although Antonia Fraser and the likes of her might try and rewrite history concerning the, the gunpowder plot. It was a Romanist plot. The Pope wanted to get King jo The Bible was in production. Our Bible, my Bible, was in production. 1604, they began the work. 1605, the Pope sends his fellows over to try and blow up the King and Parliament. I don't think that's a coincidence. And the, the nation understood that there is a real difference between biblical Christianity and Romanism. And so they maintained that feast on the 5th of November every year. And when I first came here and Jean first came here, we started having a bonfire out the back. Uh, we haven't done it for two or three years, but maybe, Lord willing, if we're not taken home, we might do it this year. Because I think that's an important feast, an important festival, an important time to remember. But the last thing the people of, in authority want you to think about is what happened on November the 5th, 1605. I'm tempted to go off on a tandem about the King James Bible here because it's, that's when it was... But I won't, I won't. You've had enough of it, probably. The reading of the law was to be carried out, I think, at certain of the other feasts in Israel. They were to gather together and they were to read the law. God wanted to, to, them to remember. And time and time they're told, meditate. The man in Psalm 1, but in his law doth he meditate day and night. God wanted his people to know the law, to know the words that he'd given to them. He wanted them to remember them. The kings were told back there in those books of Moses to read the scriptures that they might rule with wisdom. And by repeatedly reading, Israel were to be reminded of God's dealings with them. 
to strengthen their faith and trust. It's one of the reasons we meet together, probably a main reason we meet together. We remember the Lord Jesus, but we want to be opening the Bible. We want to be encouraging one another to open the Bible. I'm encouraging one another to be reading the Word of God, believing the Word of God, walking in the, the light of the Word of God, and just shutting off all that stupidity that the world is so full of. We need to frequently pause, come to Calvary, and find a rest in remembering the blood that was shed for us. This is the important feast, of course, for the church. Different churches celebrated different occasions, some at once a month, some in the evening, some in the morning, some every week, because the scripture doesn't lay down, as far as I know, in the book of Acts, any particular time, except maybe uh, Sunday, the first day of the week. And... Uh, for me, the, the more frequent, the better. Uh, for me personally, I think once a week is great. But it is, it is given to us that we should remember. Do this in remembrance of me. And of all the things that we as Christians need to remember, we need to remember Calvary. When you're in trouble, when you're under pressure, when you're sick, when you're in real difficulties, the best place to go is Calvary. Because we need, at such times, we need to be reassured that God loves us. To think of all else we all need this morning is reassurance that God loves us. I need it. I, I need it like you wouldn't believe. To be reassured that he loves me. And Calvary just shows how much. I don't think we'll ever know, any of us, what he suffered. He tasted my hell. Personally, I believe he literally went there. Personally. Some, some of the brethren don't like that. I ain't going to fall out with them over it, but I think he went there. I think the Bible's New Testament's clear about that. What a sacrifice. It's, it's beyond imagining what he paid to save us. And it just tells us how much he loves us. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? This is the central truth of the Christian faith. You might not understand prophecy, don't lose any sleep over it. You might not know any Greek, don't lose any sleep over it. You might not be as familiar as you ought to be with the history of Israel, don't lose any sleep over it. But don't forget Calvary. You and I should be like the kings of Israel, daily reading the word that we might know how to live. So much for the Bible's integrity and so forth, the integrity of its history. We could say much more about that, but I haven't got the strength yesterday, to be honest, to put any more notes down. Verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 of our chapter 24 in Joshua. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. At your leisure, if you go on a couple of pages, you'll find the journeys that Balaam and Balak travelled in order to get Balaam to curse Israel. So a map or two further on. I won't take you there now. But this is a remarkable incident. It's a very instructive incident. Can I read those two verses again? Verse 9. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, which is way down south, on the eastern side of Jordan arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam the son of Beor to curse you but I would not this is the Lord speaking remember but I would not hearken unto Balaam therefore he blessed you still so I delivered you out of his hand that Balaam was a strange character he seems without doubt to have had the ear of God and yet he was a covetous man and we read about him in Jude I think and, and in Peter he was a covetous man he could be bought and can I just in passing say this should never be true of any Christian we should always be willing to do the will of God whatever it is and never allow ourselves to be bought or bribed or enticed away by the love of money and Balaam was such a man he was covetous and Balak the king of Moab offered Balaam riches if he would curse Israel but as we've read here God wouldn't let him do it Balaam found a way around what the Lord had said to him uh, but God still wouldn't let him curse Israel 
And what is astounding about that is found in Numbers 23 and 21. Can I just direct you to that? Numbers 23 and 21. And I remember one of the first times, well, maybe the first time I read this many years ago, I just, I just, it blew my mind. Numbers 23 and verse 21. This is Balaam prophesying at the request of Balak and Balaam has been asked to curse Israel and this is what he says in Numbers 23 and 21 of the Lord he says he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel the Lord his God is with him and the shades of a king is among them now if you've read if you go through Numbers and you get to this point you've seen nothing but rebellion <laughs> you've seen nothing but they are just murmuring they are complaining They've come through the wilderness. In fact, they are they are still in the wilderness at this point, I think. And um, they've done nothing but complain. The incident with the serpent on the pole after they that many of them that's before this. But what does God say? He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither have you seen perverses. The Lord his God is with him, and the shades of a king is among them. That's amazing grace. That's what that is. That's amazing grace. And it really strikes you as you read through Numbers and you come to that place. And you read about nothing but whining and moaning. Let's go back to Egypt. We don't want Moses. We want, uh, uh, what was his name, Korah and Dathan. Just grumbling out. And, and God plagued them and they, many of them died. And then he says here, he hath not beheld iniquity in Israel. That's grace. And I praise God that because of the blood of Christ, he doesn't behold iniquity in me. And if you're sheltered under the blood today, he doesn't behold iniquity in you either. In terms of retribution, that's all dealt with by the Saviour. He will see where we are, and if necessary, he will correct us. But he will not hold one sin against us in eternity. Been thinking about the jab. The BB, I mean, I don't watch it, but you know, you can't escape it, can you? They keep telling us we've got to have the jab. I don't know how many I've had for the NHS, I don't even open them. I've got to be screened for bowel cancer, or what? <laughs> I just put them straight into bed. What they're screening me for now, and I've had several on the jab, I'm sure. Plus a phone call, why haven't you replied to the letter? You know, at least the lady was nice about it, and I don't know why I'm telling you this just now. I'll probably come back, I'll probably come back. I've lost my thread altogether, so I might come back to that. But this is extraordinary. I have not been held, beheld in equity in Israel and God doesn't see it in you and he doesn't see it in me. Praise God for that. We are accepted in the beloved. When you pray, when I pray, when you come to God and I come to God, he sees us in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, God's not listening. If you're not in Christ, you have no acceptance with God whatsoever. No matter how much you pray, no matter how much you fast, no matter how much you do missionary work, no matter how much you read the Bible, if you're not in Christ, God's not listening. The first thing you need to do if you're not a Christian this morning is to believe that Christ died for your sins. He was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. If you haven't believed that, you haven't started. I say that just in case there's anybody here this morning that's got Christian religion but doesn't have Christ and I fear there may be. I don't know. God hasn't told me. Another uh, important truth is illustrated I think in this account of Balaam. Let's go to Isaiah 54. Another important truth, I think, to my mind, comes out of this history of Balaam, and it's in Isaiah 54. <coughs> Excuse me, Isaiah 54. Don't say bless you. That they used to say that because I thought the devil was coming out. I used to think that when you sneeze, the devil was coming out, so they'd say gesundheit or bless you or whatever. Well, I'm pretty sure I haven't got a devil. It's just a sneeze. Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Aha, back to the jab. I got it. People are worried about the jab. And I suppose understandably, especially if they're unsaved people, but even some Christians are worried about it. And some are saying it, ch it changes your DNA. It will actually change your DNA and if people are frightened to death. Listen, they can destroy the body, but they can't touch your soul. The jab cannot touch your soul. If you're a Christian this morning, your soul is redeemed. You're bound for glory. And no matter what they inject into you, they cannot stop you going to glory. The Lord Jesus said they can destroy the body, but beware of him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. 
They can't touch the soul. The jab cannot touch your soul. I would exhort you not to take it. That's your business. I'm not going to take it by the grace of God with the Lord's help. Um, but let's go back to Isaiah 54:17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, including the jab. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Satan can do nothing without God's permission. This man might have been capable, Balaam might have been capable of cursing Israel, but not without God's permission. So he couldn't do it. And Satan, get this and mark it down, Satan can do nothing to you, nothing without God's permission. Nothing at all without God's permission. And God loves you and I perfectly. Some Christians are overwhelmed, they take up all their time in what the occult's up to, and now the church, occult's come into the church. They're, all, they're fascinated with Satan, some Christians are. That's all they think about. And they want some expert that's come out of Satanism that's now a Christian to tell them all about the things they used to do, like Mr. Schnurbelin who I think has gone off the rails personally. Satan can do nothing without God's permission. You can read it in the book of Job. I've got a, no, I haven't got me, I've got me wide margin Bible with me, I forgot that. But you know, he's, uh, one man, I think it's William Gurnall, likens to Satan as a dog sitting by the table waiting for a bone. And he's looking at his master and Satan's looking at the Lord. And until the Lord says, okay, he can do nothing. He will do everything he can within the allowance that God gives. He did everything he could to Job. He made that man's life utter misery. He, did, he hit him with everything he got, but God said, save his life. And Satan had got to do it. Satan has terrible power, make no mistake. But he cannot disobey God. He just cannot. You might think, well, he's Satan, he will disobey God. He can't. <laughs> Personally, I think he's frightened of him. I think he's frightened of him. And if you knew what God's like, you'd be frightened of him too. We're not frightened of God anymore. We're not. I tell you what, brother, if he just starts to chastise you, look out. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. We have lost the fear of God. Most of us. Satan's frightened of him. His power is unimaginable. When he comes in the book of the Revelation, chapter 19, comes on that white horse, he deals with the Antichrist and all his armies. One verse. <laughs> he speaks and it's done. And we read that the blood flows for 200 miles up to the horse's bridles. You can't mess with God. And Satan knows it. He can't. He daren't. He just daren't. So don't forget when you think that the devil is crushing you, God's watching. If you're the Lord's, he's watching. And the devil can't go an inch, not an inch, past God's will. And I'll tell you what, that is, that is such a relief. That is such a relief. So whatever we experience of good or ill comes, if we're Christians, from a loving God. And you know, there are times when I've found that hard to believe, and perhaps you have too. There are times maybe when you've been in deep trial, and you've wondered, does God love me? Well, the Bible tells us he does. And I believe he will sometimes take us into the deepest, darkest places. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, says David. Because he knew, Psalm 139, he knew God was always with him, always, every moment. But in deep trial we might find it hard to believe, but it's absolutely biblical that God loves us. So let's just look for a moment. I'm preaching far longer than I thought I would, but I hope you're okay with that. It won't be long now. John's Gospel, chapter 17, has been very precious to me of late. John 17. And uh, verse 15. John 17 and verse 15. The Lord Jesus is praying to the Father. This is truly the Lord's Prayer, this chapter. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. He seals that prayer with his blood. Christ is just going to the cross here. This is the prayer just before the cross. And he seals that prayer with his blood and he's prayed for you and I that God his Father would keep us from evil. And he will. 
God, God cannot refuse the Lord Jesus. He will not turn away that prayer that the Lord made and sealed it with his blood. He will never leave us nor forsake us because Christ said, keep them through thy name. Because Christ said in that same prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God will keep his own. Well, what about brother so-and-so? Well, stick with the Bible and you'll have more joy. Brother so-and-so may not really have been brother so-and-so. That's all I can say. Because I believe God keeps his people. The Lord Jesus died and shed his blood requesting it. I do not believe for one moment that God will ever refuse any request here in John 17. It's a precious prayer to me. I can't tell you the strength this has brought to me under great trial. Finally, Joshua 24, one more point. Verse 13. Verse 13. And I have given you a land for which you did not labour, and cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not do ye eat. So they went into these lands, they went into Canaan, they went east of Jordan, and the cities and the houses were all waiting for them. They killed all the people there. I think in some of the cities the women and children were spared, but in some of them they were devoted to destruction, which I can't go into this morning, we've touched on this in the past. But the houses were all waiting, the properties were all waiting, furnished presumably, everything was there for them. And they were told, of course, to destroy the idols. So the children of Israel simply moved into those hem empty houses. And that's been happening in England now for quite a while. You've probably heard of the White Flight. The uh, indigenous British, many of them, are fleeing abroad, places like uh, Australia, because they don't like the... Uh, I'm not going to say they don't like Asians or they don't like Africans. I'm not. That's not my point whatsoever. That some of them may, some of them may not. Many of them I'm sure do not. But they have a sense, like Dorothy did. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Wizard of Oz, yeah, Dorothy. We're not, we're not, this is not Kansas anymore, Toto. And where I live, it's not Kansas anymore. It's not England anymore. It's not Birmingham anymore. Where I live, I can walk out of my house. Not hear, I can walk half a mile and not hear a word of English. My local park, if you can you spot the white man, I'll tell you what. Now, I'm not criticising black people, I'm just telling you, you know, that the culture's changed. It's not Kansas anymore. And the white people have gone, many of them, and folks are coming from countries that they trashed, they bombed, they've killed one another, they've got nothing left, and they've come over here and their houses are already in waiting. And the councils are seeing to it, that the flats are being built, and it's all coming cheap and it's already in waiting. Now don't misunderstand me and think this is racism. You've got a problem in your brain if you think this is racism. It's just plain statement of fact. I don't, I don't hate Muslims, I don't hate black people, not at all. But when I walk up my local park, which is about a quarter of a mile from me, uh, last week I went up, there must have been one white person in a hundred. And I'm not exaggerating. Walk out of my house now, I can walk a quarter of a mile, not hear a word of English. I can smell the curry. Now, you know, if the Lord wants to save them, wonderful. And I don't despise them for coming over here. Wouldn't you and I take the same opportunity? I'm simply saying, it's not England. It's not the country I grew up in. And what happened in Canaan, the Israelites moved in, the houses were already built. It's happening here. And why is that? Because the English have departed from the Lord, that's why. This country prospered greatly in the 19th century, because probably of three centuries of powerful Christian ministry. I mean, man did we lead the world in Christian ministry during that period. We sent missionaries everywhere. The greatest and the brightest of preachers came out of this country during those, during those centuries. Uh, what we say in 16th through 19th century. And of course, the rot had begun by the, by the 19th century. John Ruskin, I think he was an English teacher. I think it's him who said at the end of the 19th century, to be born an Englishman is to win first prize in the lottery of life. And he was probably telling the truth at the time. I don't know whether it was him or Cecil Rhodes, who was one of his students, that said that. To be born an Englishman is to win first prize in the lottery of life. And uh, I'm thankful I was born here. As rotten as things have become, and as rotten as they were when I was born, I'm thankful I was born here. Because there's been some strong Christianity in this country. 
we have some strong and wonderful history of the Christian faith in this country but now the houses are all being occupied by those who worship Muhammad or Mary or whoever Confucius whoever and as the Christian faith has died out so the land is being filled and occupied by those who have no knowledge of the Lord Jesus but there is an encouragement here as well for us let's just read verse 13 again as I close and I have given you a land for which you did not labour and cities which you built not and you dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted not do ye eat the saviour said in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you there's a place waiting for us that is infinitely more glorious than the one you're living in now and I don't care if you live in Solihull there's a, there's a palace waiting for us there's a mansion waiting for us the Lord said I go to prepare a place and God is preparing a wonderful place for his people and I'm looking forward to going I don't watch Homes Under the Hammer I think that's what it's called and I don't watch all these place in the country stuff because it just makes me covetous and I'm going somewhere better anyway and the Lord's preparing it for us so be encouraged with that one day we shall enter the new Jerusalem which will be empty and waiting for us a place infinitely more wonderful than anywhere on earth Amen Amen